Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Matthew Taylor. Uh, I'm Chief Executive of the RSA. Um, and uh, after the last few weeks, I feel like I'm about 100 years old. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this lunchtime event. Could you make sure your mobile phone is switched to uh, silent, but you don't need to turn it off? In fact, we'd be happy for you to be tweeting as you listen to the event, participate in it. The hashtag is RSA100. Uh, we're filming today, live streaming over the web, so welcome to people who are watching uh, online. I remember uh, when I was young and I lived in York and there was a the guy who ran the local cinema who had a reputation for being mean uh, uh, d um, made a joke at his own expense which is that he, when you go to the cinema there'd be a sign that he put up on the outside that said uh, anyone over 60 can have free ticket to the cinema and then he put in brackets as long as you bring both your parents. <laughs> Now, this was considered then to be very funny because obviously it didn't apply to anybody. Um, but as a 55-year-old who is delighted to have both my parents alive, I, I, if I go back in time, I could get a free cinema <laughs> ticket. So the world is, the world is changing. And, and that's why it's a great pleasure to introduce today's speakers, Linda Grattan and Andrew Scott. Linda uh, and Andrew are colleagues at London Business School and they're co-authors of this wonderful book, uh, The Hundred uh, Year life. The book brings together their respective expertise in psychology and economics to demonstrate how we can redesign our finances, our education, our career, our relationships, our worldview, I think I would add, uh, and work uh, to uh, respond to these changes in our life expectancy. Having held posts at Harvard, the LSE and, and, and Oxford University, Andrew Scott is now a professor of economics at London uh, Business School. His research and advisory work focuses on the short and long-run forces that affect business and is published widely in international academic journals. Linda Grattan is professor of management practice at London Business School, leads the Future of Work Consortium for Business Collaboration. She's written extensively about the interface between people and organisations and the impact of the changing world on employment and work. She's spoken at the RSA before. So as I say, Linda and Andrew are joining us today to discuss the impact of increased life expectancy uh, and the role that... Governments must play, institutions must play, individuals must play, but all of us must play in ensuring that everyone, including ourselves, lives a creative and fulfilling longer life. Uh, they're going to be a double act. Yeah. I don't know if it's Morecambe and Wise or no. Little and Large or... Um, <laughs> Sonny and Cher, let's choose oh, that. Uh, Actually, I've got a wig, a black wig. Um, they're going to do a double act. They're going to speak for ten minutes each. Then I'm going to ask them a few questions and we'll open it up to you. So, uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Linda and Andrew. Thank you. <laughs> the Sunny and Cher is really taking me back, Matthew. I love it. Thank you. Thank you for that. We'll have to tweet a picture of us with long black wigs on. Um, well, we are fascinated in uh, what happens when everybody lives to 100. That's really the question that Andrew and I asked ourselves four years ago. It's the question we researched. It's the question we wrote the book about. Why, why do we think it's such an important question? Well, the simple truth is that right around the world, uh, people are living longer. And it's absolutely astounding. Every 10 years, people are living two years longer. And that means that if you take that down to a year, it's a couple of months per, per, per year. If you take it down to a day, it's like being given a few more hours every single day. And the reason we're saying that rather than it's all about being old is we think that the conversation about the 100-year life has really been hijacked by Alzheimer's and by pensions. And that's not to say both of those are important, but what we want to argue is that when life elongates, it actually elongates. It's not just about what happens at the end of life, it's what happens at every single stage in your life. And what we argue in the book is that what we're beginning to see, we're beginning to see the beginnings of experiments about a profoundly different way of thinking about our lives. And we think it could be a curse, but we see it as an amazing gift. And we want to show you how you make it that amazing gift. And so here is what we know right now. But actually, this is already old data. You know, if you're born as I was uh, in 1955, then right now you're expected 
to live in, to about 88. I'm actually going to live to 100, so I'm, I'm unusual in that respect. Um, but uh, you can see already that what we thought about our lives is elongating. And that, and this is the way we see it, is about more productive hours. So if you take out all the sort of the things, the unproductive things you do in the day, these are the hours that you've got more. And that's actually what we focused our ideas about. We said, what would you do if you had more hours? What would you do if you had more hours every week? What would you do if you had more hours every year? And what would you do if your whole life suddenly elongated in front of you? And that's happening for people all around the world. And it's a, a huge a challenge, and but of course, an enormous opportunity. And of, and the, the first, first point to say about that, of course, is that if you live longer, then unless you have an extraordinary source of income, which is unrelated to, the, to, your, to your work, you will have to work longer. And I'm really fortunate to be working with Andrew, who is an economist, and he worked out just what that means. And you'll see in the book that we give you pretty detailed data about that. I'm actually going to talk about that today. We're, we, we, we're reversing our normal presentation today. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And to help us understand uh, what it means to live longer lines, lives, we invented three personas. Uh, one we call Jack, which in many ways, Jack in many ways, uh, his life portrays the life that organizations are often based on. You know, he retired at 65 on a pretty good pension. Uh, he was then able to live happily on his pension until he passed away sometime in his 70s. He had a traditional life. Uh, his wife, uh, Jill, obviously. Jill stayed at home. You see, we have a bit of a sunny and share moment as well. His, his wife stayed at home whilst Jack was the, the primary breadwinner. And then we get Jimmy. And actually, Jimmy is now midlife, and we, we, we've been talking about this around the world recently, the book, and one of our groups said they wanted T-shirts saying, Je suis Jimmy, because Jimmy actually is many of us, you know, midlife, realizing when he started that he might have been like Jack, retiring at 65, and midlife realizing that suddenly this extraordinary new opportunity but also challenge is, a, is ahead of him. And I think for lots of people and for lots of companies, it's Jimmy that's really interesting to them. How does, what does Jimmy now do? And then we have Jane, and Jane's in her early 20s. And in many ways, we, this is the group that, that Andrew and I teach at London Business School. And in many ways, you know from your own kids and those of you who are in your 20s yourself here, that people are sort of getting that their lives are a lot longer. And some of the choices that you see them already making are going to, are going to make that change. Now, what does that actually look like? Well, Jack could retire at 65 and still save a relatively small proportion of his, his income because, of course, Jack was also living in a world where... Uh, state and corporations gave pensions. But when we come to look at Jimmy, uh, if he wanted to be a Jack and retire at 65, he, and he has a longer life expectancy, he would have to be saving 17% of his income. And we know that Jimmy is not doing that. So we expect that Jimmy will have to work into his, or will work into his early 70s. So already we see what we consider to be a normal life, a normal three-stage life, full-time education, full-time work, full-time retirement, beginning to break up. And here's Jane. If Jane wanted to be like Jack and retire at 65, she would have to save around 25% of her income. And of course, Jane isn't doing that. It's, it's unlikely that Jane will ever do that. So again, her working life is going to extend, and we expect Jane to be working into her 70s or her early 80s. So you can see immediately that ideas about what life is, what work is, are going to be changing very fundamentally. Um, now, we can already see that. And one of the points that Andrew and I were sort of fascinated by was where will all this start? And of course, it will start by individuals, by families, by communities beginning to get a notion of how they're going to redesign their life. And if you look at American data, and US, uh, this is US data, but the UK data is very similar, you can see that people are already 
working longer than 65 years old. Uh, and from 1982 onwards, uh, more and more people have decided to carry on working. And there's all sorts of good reasons for doing that. You know, the data on cognitive, um, you know, co cognitive development tells us that people who carry on working tend to have you know, more cognitive health. Those who retire early and have very uh, immobile lives have less, less cognitive health. And so we think that one of the big implications of that is that that brings intangible assets to the fore. What do we mean by that? Well, in a short life, uh, your tangible assets, your money, your, your wealth, your housing, whatever it is you've managed to accumulate, allows you to, to stop work and to retire. Your intangible assets help you to carry on working. And that's why we believe intangible assets are so important. And one of the pieces of work that Andrew and I had to do was to describe what intangible assets are, because there isn't any agreed model of intangible assets right now. And we don't think, by the way, that this will be the final model, but it's our attempt to describe what it would be, what you would need to live a long, productive life. And we think there's three things. Uh, number one... Uh, is around, obviously around skills. I, I've written extensively, and I know you at the RSA have thought extensively about the impact that artificial intelligence and robotics has on work. And what we know is that Jane not only is going to work for a long time, but she'll also do it in an incredibly dynamic labour market. So her capacity to keep highly, uh, uh, to, to be learning a lot, to really keep her skills up is going to be absolutely crucial. So we think one of her intangible assets is her capacity to be, be, be skilled, to have valuable knowledge uh, and, in, and indeed valuable capabilities. We also think that there's a social capital element here because we know that much valuable uh, skills is created through intangible assets and is created through uh, tacit knowledge. And tacit knowledge comes primarily through working with close ties with peer groups. So we think that her capacity to develop peers is going to be important and also uh, we think that reputation is going to be key. Now it's not surprising I don't think that our second uh, asset is around vitality because clearly you know as health as your life elongates health becomes really important. Um, being ill at 60 if you're going to pass away at 70 is one thing, but it, being ill at 60 and then living diverse, a network of diverse acquaintances. Why homogenous networks, people who are just like you, do not encourage you to change. It's through diversity that you learn to change. And I'm going to hand over to Andrew, but before I, as, as I do so, can I also remind you that we've written, and we have an amazing website. One of the things that Andrew and I decided to do was to put a lot of resources into building a website, www.100yearlife.com. And if you go to it, and I suggest you do, and send it to your friends, you'll find that there's a diagnostic there that helps you to decide whether you're building, maintaining, or depleting your tangible and intangible assets. Over to Andrew. Thank you, Linda. So, uh, you know, really what we're about is that with growing longevity, we have more time. And of course, this is not about aging. This is about we have more time for life. And that so much of our economic, financial, and social world is designed around the longevity of 70 years and the three-stage life that Linda's been talking about of education, work, retirement, cannot be made to fit if it's simply stretched out to 100. So we need to redesign time. Great example at the beginning about the cinema owner saying, you know, uh, over 60 you can join in with your parents. You know, we're used to three generation households. We talk about the sandwich generation. We're gonna have four generation households. We need to start talking about the club sandwich generation <laughs> and how we allocate those social roles, who's responsible for whom, all needs to be start from scratch. So with so much extra time, we redesign the big chunks of life, the stages of life, but also we believe also within the year as well. So we think we're going to see the emergence of whole new stages of life. Now the 20th century saw the emergence, I would say, of two new stages of life. Anyone know what they were? What, what are the two new stages of life that emerged in the 20th century? Teenagers. Teenagers, absolutely. We used to have children, we used to have adults. Starting late 19th century, we saw adolescence, and then 1960s, we finally got the concept of teenagers. 
Yeah, retirement. One of the fantastic achievements of the 20th century was the creation of retirement. People used to basically work until they died. And they earned less and less as they became more and more physically feeble. And they stayed with their children because they couldn't afford an independent existence. But we created this fantastic time where people weren't at work and they had leisure and they were financially independent. So that was two stages created in the 20th century. We think already we're beginning to see new stages emerge. But the 21st century will see the creation of many more stages because you can't stretch out that three-stage life. If you stretch out that second stage of work, as Linda was saying, that solves a financial problem, but what about your fitness? What about your skills? What about your relationships? It just simply doesn't work. You go into the red on your intangible assets. So we believe strongly you're going to have a multi-stage life, not a three-stage life. You may have two or three different careers, particularly someone like Jane. Jimmy has, a choice, has fewer choices. And of course, if you have a multi-stage life with multi-careers, one may be about financial security, others may be about a work-life balance or making a contribution to society. So we can see whole new stages of careers begin to emerge. So here's some examples. The explorer phase has kind of always been there. You take a gap year before university. I see more and more people taking years after university in their 40s and also in their 60s. So this is true exploration. It might be geographical, it might be intellectual, it might be cultural. But it's about doing something different and learning and going outside of your normal habitat. Something I'm very excited about are what I call independent producers. If you read about the history of teenagers, they kind of emerged as an independent consumer. You know, they have their own money that they get from the bank of mum and dad, and they spend it in well-defined sort of ways. If you're looking at those 18 to 30, something different is happening whether it be Brooklyn or Shoreditch, you're seeing a sort of mixture of work and leisure, very asset light, but where people are exploring in an independent producer way, I would say. They're being entrepreneurs, but not in a sort of Alan Sugar way of trying to build up a big empire. They do a pop-up. And of course, within the notion of a pop-up is the creation and the demise. This is about learning skills, learning values, and learning about who you are. And it's postponing the point in which you become as it were, a fully-fledged adult in terms of economic independence. If, ra if life has gone from being a 10,000-meter race to a 15,000-meter race, you hit certain times at different points. You don't run it at a different pace. And so we're seeing the age of marriage, the age of starting a career, buying a house, having children, all extend. Now, part of that is about negative economic features. Gosh, houses are so expensive. But part of it, we argue, is about options. Options are more valuable the longer over which they're held. And if you live a longer life, options become more valuable. So the younger you are, the less you commit. You're hitting those milestones later. But independent producers is not just about the 18 to 30-year-olds. You're seeing big increases in entrepreneurship at age 60 because if you have a lifestyle that blends work and leisure, and if you can make sure you bring enough money in to cover your expenses, it preserves your pension. So we're seeing some very interesting behavior that's similar in the 20s and also in the 60s. And that, of course, is one of the key points I'll come into in a minute. If you have a multi-stage life, you can arrange the blocks in different ways. With a three-stage life, you have education, you have work, you have retirement. You have a real segmentation by age. With a multi-stage life that can be arranged in many ways, that age segmentation starts to break down. Portfolio stage is uh, uh, perhaps a well-known Charles Handy, our former colleague from London Business School, talks much about a, a, a balance of different activities. The gig economy at a younger age is perhaps a less positive way of looking at the, uh, the portfolio. And then transitions, as Linda said. In a, long life of, in a longer life, you go through more change and more transitions. We have to be more flexible and able to deal with that. With the end of a three-stage life, we see the end of lockstep. William Faulkner says, you get out of lockstep, you get trampled under uh, underfoot. Right now, age is stage. If you're 20, I know you're an undergraduate. If you're 40, I know your motivations. We believe over a longer life, you could be an undergraduate but be 20, 40, or 60. You could be a senior manager and be 30, 50, and 70. This simple equation of age and stage is going to start to get undermined. So we're going to see, a lot, hopefully, a lot more generational mixing, but also we're going to see a lot more flexibility in how you look at a CV. Right now, if you've got a year break, it's something suspicious. And that, of course, leads to all sorts of challenges in terms of gender diversity, for instance. But if more and more people have got more and more nonlinear careers and more breaks, that negative signal becomes less apparent. 
So the end of lockstep. Massive challenge for HR, a massive challenge for legislation. It's no longer at 65, this is what you do. It becomes a much more complicated process where people choose at different ages what they want to do. Um, so, of course, the HR issues become very, very complicated. There's some of the issues we list up here. But what I want to focus on, I think, are some of the policy challenges. Let's go away from individuals and corporates to some of the policy challenges. <coughs> We're very aware in society of inequality at the moment. It's becoming more and more of a problem in how we run uh, the countries. I go around talking about how China needs to reform its institutions. I've realized after Brexit that perhaps the UK needs to reform its institutions as well. Uh, but inequality. This longer life is not for everyone. There are staggering inequalities in longevity by age. Um, if you look at the bottom 10% of the population in terms of income and the richest 10%, we're talking about 10 to 12 years difference of life expectancy. That seems inexcusable. And whereas, of course, when you have taxation, you can take money from the rich and give it to the poor, you can't take years of life from the rich and give it to the poor. So tackling this is going to be a very, very profound problem. And it's actually getting worse because you're actually seeing longevity decline for many of those at the bottom end of the income distribution. And um, that's uh, also, we talk about disability risk. The problem with longevity numbers is they're all averages. And life is cruel because we don't all live the average life. And so whilst on average we're living longer, whilst on average we're healthier for longer, unfortunately that's not the case for everyone. So society is developing a, a big new risk it's never had before. For most of human history, most people's experience in terms of longevity was less than the average. Most people died at an age less than the average. The median was below the average. Now we're living for longer, more people are living above the average. More than 50% of the population live better than the average. That then creates an interesting new risk because for most of society, uh, most of his, human history, the risk is you die young, but now the risk is you live long but get incapacitated early. So that's a risk that we haven't had before in human society, and the financial implications of that, I think, are enormous. How do we provide insurance? Linda gets cross with me here because I get a bit nerdy at this point. Uh, reverse tontines is something I'm very excited about, but that probably means nothing to most people. Um, but protecting retirement. The obvious thing to do is to increase retirement age because people are living for longer. But if we go back to the inequality point, if we push retirement age out to 70 and early 70s, but the bottom end of the income distribution are dying at 70, we've removed one of the greatest achievements that society had in the 20th century, retirement. This seems to me a, a crucial challenge. I'll skip the data for time. Um, generational conflict in general, Linda and I don't like this notion of generational conflict. We think actually the whole point about a longer life is it starts to break down generational labels. But clearly there are uh, uh, some generational issues here, including in the workforce. Because as you extend the age at which people are working, what does that imply for working conditions and promotions? There's also a very interesting issue here as well, which society needs to deal with. If my children live 10 years longer than me, then in some sense they're better off in terms of welfare than me. So is it then fair that I give them some debt to carry forward? You know, there's some interesting issues. If you think about welfare, it's about income and it's about longevity. And so if we're going to equalize welfare across the generations, perhaps it is fair to pass debt on to the next generation if they're living for longer. But how on earth do we get the institutions to strike a fair deal with that? Um, flexible work and flexible working time. Uh, one of the big issues that Linda and I uh, discovered in looking at this book was not just the big blocks of time, but the small blocks of time. So much of our working week is structured from the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution invented factories, and therefore invented work and home as separate activities. It defined work time and it defined leisure time in a way where they'd been blended before. It forced the children out of the factories into the home, which then created a split in gender roles, and it created a really big shift in the nature of the family. We then saw a massive labor movement develop to try and redefine and reclaim leisure and family time. And so we eventually ended up with a five-day working week. It's clear that over a multi-stage life, sometimes I'm happy working six days a week, sometimes just two days a week. I'm going to have much more diversity and flexibility in my working hours than we're currently the corporates allow for. With the Industrial Revolution, the corporates won out. The power of machinery said, I need you to have a regular working time. <coughs> Nowadays, if it's going to be more about human capital and uh, human creativity, that flexibility is going to be important. How do we get that creation with that conflict between what firms want and what we as individuals want. 
And then I touched briefly on families and relationships earlier. Um, anyone know the fastest growing age group in the UK for divorce at the moment? It's actually 80s. As a percentage from a very, very low base, uh, uh, divorce is, but divorce is falling, but 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, divorce is, is rising. So uh, yeah, I'm not sort of, I think that's something to do with longevity, but clearly our whole social norms will shift and change. They already have done. The concept of marriage, of course, has clearly come a long way, but we have whole new experiments to allocate. In that four generation household, who's responsible for the children? Who's responsible for the great grandparents? And how do I get the work flexibility to deal with those new obligations? We believe that we're already seeing a lot of experimentation, but we stand in the early stages of what will be a profound redefinition of time and life, which affects not just you as individuals, not just corporates, but the whole of social norms. Um, uh, so, well, well, this is the point I just made. We're seeing a major redesign of life. Our current social, economic, and financial configurations are based on a longevity that suited Jack, suited our grandparents, but is not a reality for us. A life expectancy of 70 is not what we have. The three-stage life, our legal systems, has an interpretation of certain numbers, as like 65 and 18, as having a meaning they no longer have. And we are seeing this huge experimentation that we will witness in the years to come. So thank you very much. Well, thank you both, and um, we'll open up for questions on the floor in a minute, but I'm actually going to ask you one question. Um, if we'd had this event three weeks ago, you know, your book is challenging, but it's positive. Mm. Uh, but in the time, of, in the last three weeks, we had the Brexit vote, and one of the elements of that vote has been a uh, polarising of this kind of intergenerational conflict argument with a lot of young people being very angry about the way in which a lot of older people voted. And so I suppose what I want to ask you is this, how do we, how confident are you and how do we break out of what seems to me to be a, a, a kind of negative cycle whereby on the one hand, older people uh, have too much political influence, and you can see that in fiscal choices and what's happened to pensions. I know when I was in Downing Street that when it came to things like social care reform, the barrier to social care reform was a, re a resistance to saying difficult things to yeah. old people about the fact that some of the extra, extra money for social care had to be paid out of older people making a greater contribution. So you've got this kind of story of older people's selfishness and politicians' fear of older people because they vote, and then you've got Brexit. On the other hand, you've got a pervasive ageism, which discounts older people's wisdom, yeah. and which in some ways is getting worse because as technology changes, it's hard enough for those of us in our 30s to feel that we can keep up with the way in which technology is changing, let alone for people who are older than that. So it seems to me this is the kind of trap we're caught in, where older people often feel they're not respected, their wisdom doesn't matter, they live in an ageist society, they're written off, and possibly the way in which they then respond to that is to say, well, I'll just look after myself, thank you very much, and by the way, I don't think much of the way the world's going. Now, that is a negative way of viewing things, but uh, because in a way your book is positive, I thought I would challenge you with that. Shall I say something about age agnostic, and then yeah. you can say something about the economics of it? Yeah. Um, so, I, I think that one of the reasons... It's been interesting for me because um, I'm at the age, I'm of an age where uh, going through my career, the big issue was about ge gender discrimination. And, and so it's interesting now in my 60s to, f to m meet the next one, which is age discrimination. So I, I actually can feel it as well as ex you know, experience it. I'm lucky to be in um, London Business School, doesn't have any retirement age. So we can actually go on forever and we've got we've got professors who, who certainly do that. Um, I have professors who went on forever. Yes, they well, did. Yeah. I think you love them the <laughs> That's most. That's just did you, did, you, did, you, did you think how wise they were, <laughs> no, Matthew? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, kind of. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. There you go. Um, so some of the st so here's, here's the thing. Some of the stereotyping of age, I think, has been because we've used these generational markers, baby boomers, 
uh, Gen Y, Gen X, and Millennium. I, I think we've got to let go of that. And in fact, what Andrew and I are going to write about that soon, we think. Um, why? Well, because the, 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 it, when people start, you know, age is very good if everybody's doing the same thing at a certain age, but let's imagine they're not. Let's imagine the new stages that Andrew described happen at any age. So let's imagine that uh, you're an independent producer and you're working with a 20-year-old who's an independent producer and a 40-year who's an independent producer and a 70-year-old who's an independent producer. Would age really be the primary characteristic at which you describe those people? It certainly shouldn't be. I mean, I think that the society that we're building should be age agnostic. It really shouldn't. We shouldn't have age as the major marker, just as we shouldn't have had gender as a major marker of, somebody, of what somebody is. And, and actually, lockstep reinforce that. But once each of us designs our own life, why wouldn't we be doing different, you know, the same thing with people at different ages? And we know that once different ages start working together on the same task, then, because the, you see, you, you saw your lectures in a, you, you weren't doing the same, they were teaching you. But let's imagine you're all working on the same task. Then age stereotyping breaks down very quickly. Now, you see, the, the, but you, I'm, I know I'm, Andrew's I'm, I'll bring you in, but, but, but I just, as I said, I'm only asking one question, but I'm going to pursue it a bit. <laughs> it, that, that's a kind of argument that says, I mean, it's interesting you referred to kind of, you know, women's liberation of feminism, because of course there was a split in that. Which are, there were some women who said what we want is the same as men, and other women who said no, what we want is to make the world more like the way women look at it. And in a sense, there's mm. a kind of the same yeah. thing with age, which is, is our aspiration that people in their 70s are just as kind of funky and innovative as people in their 30s, or is our aspiration that we count the things that people in their 70s are better at, more, we, we value it more highly than we do at the moment, rather than requiring those people to be good at what 30-year-olds are good at? Yeah. And our retirement process just reinforces that. The fact that we say everyone's got to leave by 60 or 65 just reinforces the fact that we, you're not productive any longer. So, I mean, I, I think this is really because it's about how we get from where we are now to where we think we should be. And that's obviously going to be a very long journey. We talk about teenagers. It took 80 years for the social concept of teenagers to emerge. Yeah. And so this is not something that happens overnight. We are already seeing changes. And of course, as with so much else, there's a lot of prejudice. There was a great example recently, I don't know if you read about it in the, uh, the, the papers, there was a, a Polish couple in the late 70s came across to visit their son or daughter in London and they went to Fabric, the, the nightclub, and everyone thought this was hilarious, it was great because they stayed there all night and got the first tube home. <laughs> uh, and uh, we got a lot of journalists press and because of the book, uh, I think Emma Jacobs from the FT got in touch with us and she wanted to quote, I said, well I'm not sure what's stranger, people in the late 70s wanting to spend time with 20 year olds in a dance hall or 20-year-olds paying to go and see the Rolling Stones in concert who are in their early 70s. So, you know, already you know, there, there's sort of numbers and then there's sort of the reality about how, how people adapt to it. We were deliberately Pollyannish because actually we think one of the, the biggest problems with longevity is people interpret it as ageing. And it's about Alzheimer's and pensions and how we can't afford it. And then it gets ghettoised. And actually, if you can say to people, well, look, actually, what's happening in your 20s, you're already doing it differently. This is about opportunities and redesign. That's how you can try and get the different generations together because they've all got a stake in it. Of course, there's a conflict, but you know, this is, I think, what, why we try to be deliberately positive and say, wow, what an opportunity this is. Now, I think your point about wisdom is absolutely right because if, if you look at how the brain operates, <laughs> mathematical ability seems to decline quite sharply from about 50 onwards which is a mathematical economist who just hit 50 is rather depressing to me. <laughs> uh, but what seems to happen is a part of your brain that is about pattern recognition kicks in. In other words, you say, oh, I've seen this before, the answer's A, as opposed to you work it out from logic. And that's wisdom. And so how do we start to bring that back into the, mm. the, in, in, into the generations? But that's not the course we're on at the moment. At the moment, everything in the corporate world is going for younger and younger. So how do we change that? And we talk a lot about juvenescence. And one of the things about living a longer life is getting better at change. And juvenescence is something that keeps you better at change. So it's down at somewhat to the individual and the corporate level. But we are seeing, I think, older people behave much younger than they used to. And that is a mixture of both being creative and playful as well as being wise. 
And that, I think, is the mix that then starts to get the intergenerational mixing going. But it, it's really important to get that younger generation away from the stereotypes. So, so that's the hard thing. Yeah, yeah. No, so so I mean, it, it, one way of looking at this is, is at the beginning, I think, of the Republic, Socrates has this passage where he says how great it is, because he's in his, I think he's in his, supposed to be in his 70s, that he doesn't, he doesn't have sexual desire anymore. Yeah. He says, I'm released. Yeah from this terrible yeah. thing that has distracted me and, yeah. and taught. Then on the other hand, you have people saying, it's great, we're going to have better and better versions of Viagra, so you, exactly. know, you can be a exactly. really randy 90-year-old. Yeah, yeah. Now, these are two different accounts of how it is we should seek to develop. One which is you know, pharmaceutical interventions to ensure that you feel like a 20-year-old. Another one is, isn't it great to reach a different stage in my life where I view things differently? There's a great book by a Stanford professor whose name I can't remember offhand, but we were quoting the book, forgive me. But he sort of says, you know, Western civilization used to, used to value the wisdom of the old, but now it's going all about juvenescence. And in terms of this battle between senescence and juvenescence, it's clear which way the pendulum swings. So I think it is more about the older generation being younger at heart and that's how they get that influence that perhaps the three-stage life says, I'm not going to listen to you anymore. Great. Fascinating stuff, isn't it? OK, who's got a question? You don't have to tell us your age when you ask it, by the way. You might be tempted age to agnostic. do that. Uh, age agnostic. We'll, we'll start here in the front. If you could tell us your name, that would be great. Yeah, my name is Joseph Heavey, um, and I think Bernard Shaw said that youth was wasted on the young. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 listen, listening to what you're saying, I, I find a very positive message, but also I think there are a lot of kind of, not downsides, but potential threats, because I think with, with the society we're going into with, with artificial intelligence, that maybe people won't have that power to negotiate and design their own lives. A lot of jobs, I think, are going to disappear, particularly professional jobs. The paradox is there will be a lot of jobs such as hairdressing, gardening, etc., that will still stay there. Uh, the other factor as well is it's, it's to do with health. People are healthier longer. So it's obvious they're going to engage in, in, in robust activities that, that are, are at the same as the young. You've just got to look at sort of... Uh, veteran uh, athletes that are running phenomenal times. So we're healthier, and that makes a huge contribution to it. Great, let's take two or three questions together. So we'll take these two, these two here. Uh, hi, I'm Carl Allen. I'm 62. When I retired at 60, I said, OK, I'll do a master's course on the acquire, you know, action learning mm. that would last me for the next 40 years because I wanted to, a healthy longevity to learn about my mind and body, only to find that no such course exists in the world. And they talk about the drain that older people will place on the NHS, but to carry on. So I've done it myself. I think I have about the next three years to acquire more action and more learning. So I'll be 65. Now, I play five-a-side football, and about a month ago, I woke up a morning and said, oh, shit, in eight years' time, I'll be 70, and I'll still be playing five-a-side football. <laughs> and then something occurred to me. Freed of the need to be a responsible adult, because my child has grown up, and she is a very responsible girl. <laughs> and freed of the need to achieve in work, because I'm retired, and freed of the need to achieve out of work, I've done a lot of things, social things, out of work. I thought to myself, you know what? My next 35 years is going to seem like 70 years. <laughs> and that sort of frightened me. What am I going to do with 70 years? And I wondered what you thought of the notion that freedom of responsibility. Yeah. You know, I can be an irresponsible adult. How will time yeah. fly by? Will, it, will my 35 years actually seem like 70? <laughs> Thank you. And then behind you? Yep. Yes, it's Prudence Clark. I'm the founder of Tempest Extra Time Wise People, which completely and utterly mirrors exactly what mm. you're saying. Um, but my question really is for, for Matthew Taylor. For me? In a way, well, it's not a question, it's really um, a request in the way that the uh, RSA have played a major part in pushing for um, social change for the self-employed, I would suggest that the RSA started up another platform for the ageing population and keeping them active and employable. 
Okay. Can I just say one thing? This, yeah. I, I really don't like the word aging population because I think it's 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 the everyone's that. aging. If you're ten or yeah. seventy, are aging. I, I, I just I, I don't know how we come up with a different phrase because yeah. I, I think that's it is a real challenge. Yeah. Other quest, uh, comments on the other question? Well, I, I just th thank you so much for those, those those observations. And we do on the website we do have a place where people put their stories, and there's quite a lot of stories already there. So we'd love to hear your story. Uh, if you know in terms of what you're how you're seeing your own life I think you know the reason that we talked about intangible assets and I said it at the beginning but it's probably worth saying again because I think it's quite a, it was quite a big insight for us tangible assets help you retire intangible assets help you keep on working and the interesting thing about intangible assets is that any point in time you're either you know developing them you're maintaining them or you're letting them atrophy and if you want to carry on being productive through your life, you have to keep an eye on your intangible assets because it's, it's they that will help you carry on you know, being productive, working, being a, a mem you know, member of, of the community. And it's very interesting if you look at those intangible assets, the role that social capital takes. And I know that the RSA is very keen on social capital and has written some wonderful things about it. And we, so, we, so we didn't mean to start with social capital, but it was an inevitable consequence of uh, living long, productive lives that, you, that your relationships and networks turn out to be really crucial. If I can just add very briefly, as an economist, actually, it's the one area I'm optimistic on, which is technology. But there's clear inequality issues. I think that links in with your point, which is about education. There is no way there is an education you get at 20 that can see you through to your late 70s if you're going to carry on working. And so I think we're going to see a major, we already are beginning, but a major change in educational provision. And whether it will be new providers, I'm not sure. But we have to think much more about how you update your skills and you, yeah. what, therefore what you learn at the beginning may be different from what you learn at the end. But I think the really interesting point, and it could be 35 years of doing nothing is, is terrible. So that's why we think you're going to have a multi-stage life and you're going to carry on doing more things later. But the really, really interesting thing, this is where it gets a bit almost Buddhist-like our approach. Um, these years of life come after childbirth. So it's not clear what the evolutionary purpose of it is. And of course, in a multi-stage life, you have the option to make more choices. So then it's really about what makes it your life. You know, in a shorter life, initial conditions matter more. Yeah. Over a longer life, there's scope for your choices to matter more. Yeah. So this is about defining who you are and what your identity is. That means those 35 years could be terrible if you're not really you, or it could be wonderfully fulfilling if you're able to do what is you. And I think that's the key challenge. Great. Uh, there's a, a lady right at the back. I mean, interesting yeah. in many ways. It, does, it puts the RSA agenda right at the centre, and I think the lady was right, you know, that this, this is a marvellous community, actually, to debate some of these issues. No, I heard the point. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, hello, my name's Lois Acton, and I'm from Urban Unlimited Network, which is about unlimited opportunity across all ages with the arts. Um, ah. My chief point is that uh, it's a question, really, but I've been working for the last year for a major philanthropist across the age agenda, looking at the research, all the in innovative ideas globally. But also, I'm a TV producer, and I'm, I'm on my fifth career. Uh, and I won't give you my age, but it is advanced. So um, what I wanted to ask was the age industry and what I've come across in the research is enormous. It's, we're talking billions and billions yeah. of pounds of money. So they are self-protectionist. <laughs> and I won't name any of the organizations, but I was horrified to find how much money is spent on aging. And mm. yet the recipients, i.e. the age group you're talking about, don't actually get the information that they deserve or the opportunities. And I think one of the key things I'd like to ask you is, how do you get rid of such an entrenched silo mentality that actually, mm. uh, that what I, I put it as actually <coughs> is that it's solely founded on age. Yeah. It's millions of pounds, whether it's pension funds, whether it's uh, yeah. research money, whether it's whatever it is. Unlock that and change social policy, how would you do that? Because I, I am one of those people you're talking about uh, who is now entering towards my 80th, and I really, um, you know, I, I completely, yeah. I'm so grateful to you for giving me a model of what I think my life is, so thank oh, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then here. Hi there, my name's Oscar Boyd. Um, 
I think a lot of what today's come about or down to is about flexibility throughout your life to do mm. different things and to achieve what you can achieve at various stages of your life. So I was wondering what you thought about concepts such as universal basic income to yeah. allow people to reach their full potential. Yeah, can't have an event at the RSA without someone advocating <laughs> universal basic income. It's mandatory. We'll take these two comments here and then we'll ask you to come in before we have to close. But yeah. I was really interested in the point on the generational wars and, and why is it that we continue to look for the differences between mm. different generations, mm. um, calling millennials lazy mm. or disloyal yeah. or um, it seems to be the prevailing way that the media and corporates like to talk about millennials when mm. I think actually works change for everyone. What mm. do we need to do to actually yeah. stop that language that yeah. is, is I think laying some kind of brand on people that's just not right? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm David Wood, Chair of London Futurists, and I'm 57 and a quarter. <laughs> I want to come back to the question at the title, How to Live to 100. Uh, you've given excellent advice uh, and stimulating advice on the kind of mental mind shift and uh, financial planning. But what about uh, kind of medical planning or lifestyle planning in such a confused and contradictory field? Have you got views as to which pieces of advice make a difference? And following on from that, do you have views about government intervention to accelerate the improvements in longe healthy longevity with more investment in genetic uh, editing or nanotechnology or artificial intelligence and therefore increase the chance that all of us, if we want to, could live to be healthy and 100? We, we had, um, I can't remember their names, but we had uh, authors here a few years ago who'd written a book on how much every single activity added minutes or took minutes away from your life expectancy. So if you have a bacon sandwich, that reduces your life expectancy by seven minutes. So are you willing? Is the trade-off. Uh, well, as, as people said, it depends on the bacon sandwich and it depends on the seven minutes. But um, uh, anyway, uh, do you want to answer those? <laughs> Well, shall I do the generation yeah. thing? And you, I'm, I'm so with you on this. Um, I'm absolutely sick and tired of hearing about millennials and baby boomers and Gen Y and Gen X, although I have written about them in the past, so I, <laughs> I stand. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's just gone, it's become ridiculous. And it's, there's very little research that it, it actually supporting it. It's mostly stereotypical. In fact, the, the, if you look at really, you know, proper research where you get, you know, proper studies, you'll find that there are incredibly few differences between age, ages. The major difference is, you know, individuals are different. They're, they're, we're all different from each other, and age isn't necessarily the major difference, just as gender wasn't. I mean, I ran this, the Lehman Centre for Women in Business at London Business School for years, and as a consequence got pushed towards gender research, which isn't my area of research, but I did. And we did loads of research, and it showed that there was really hardly any differences between men and women at work, and we couldn't really get it published because people just want to hear about stereotypical differences. So I think you're absolutely right. I'm going to have a go at it. Andrew's going to have a go at it. I don't know if that will make any difference, but we're going to hit it hard, and we're going to hit it hard within the next do you, so. do you teach marketing at London Business School? Because it yeah, seems to do. me they're the people it, we've got to go for. I'm sorry if there's any marketers in the yeah, room. Yeah, I agree. But they invent these concepts like millennials. Yeah. They're entirely marketing concepts. They have no sociological foundation at all. Yeah. And they're the ones, as the lady at the back said, yeah. target all their... You know, you can't watch daytime TV without adverts for paying for your own funeral. You know, so... <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I, I'm a full-on yeah. assault on the marketing yeah. uh, we're, we're profession. Up for it. Yeah? We're up for okay, it. Good. Yeah, yeah. Down with millennials. <laughs> one, of, one of the issues here, and again, it's why we like this focus on longevity, because it's something that everyone is hopefully benefiting from, is that you know, when I sometimes begin the, the talk here by saying, how many of you thought about how long you might live for? And for a start, only about a third of people put their hands up. Then you ask, you know, what do you base your guess on. It's always my parents and my grandparents. But if we're all living longer, there's sort of the Jimmy generation, the 40-year-old, has based his life expectancy on Jack and then finding out it's hopeless. So actually, there's a common cross-generational challenge here, but people are at different situations. And I think that's one key way of breaking it down. And your comment about the aging and the aging industry, one of the challenges we're going to have is that Government, I mean, this book started because Linda and I were having a conversation. I, as a macroeconomist, I, I hear about the pension crisis, and it says 65 year old and you retire. 18 <coughs> to 64 is working age. And that's a nonsense. We're going to redesign all these numbers. And that's where I think once the business world understands that age will no longer be such a simple signifier of demographics, yeah. that's when we get the breakthroughs. So it is a marketing, but it's actually undermining the demographic stereotypes, which I think you can already see happening. 
Universal basic income, where to begin? <laughs> um, what, what, what I do think is happening you is that... You just have to say it's a great idea. That's, <laughs> all, that's all that's required. Well, I, I, it isn't, it's, in theory, it's a great idea. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I think what we will see, because the three-stage life is very prescriptive about what we behave, it says at 65 you start doing pension. I think we'll start to increasingly see a lifetime allowance approach to loads of things, whether it be your saving, universal, but you know, when you go through these transitions in life, you need to fund them. Yeah. And so the question is, will you have sort of a lifetime universal basic income that you can claim at certain points in time? Because I don't see how we can have a realistic universal basic income for everyone and afford it, but there maybe will be lifetime measures. And I think we'll start increasingly to see the legislation be less prescriptive about nominal numbers and more about lifetime allowances. And then your point about medicine, one of the things we loved about this book is that we could read a huge literature that we weren't experts in, and we're certainly not experts in health. So my understanding is as follows. Right now, this longevity has to be earned. So the oldest person ever to live was a French lady who lived to 122. So we know that that is physically possible. But longevity is a great deal about exercising, mental engagement, and the public education around that is going to be huge. And that's why the inequality challenge is so great, mm. because public education doesn't seem to be well spread around. Mm. So that's going to be a major, major challenge. Then there is the scientific developments, which I talked about a longevity risk, but if you look at some of the optimists who claim that the first person to live to 500 has already been born, there could be massive uh, progress in this world to date. Um, that said, we are beginning to see the beginnings of research around the concept of aging rather than the heart and the lungs. So it may be we're on the verge of those big breakthroughs. Clearly, there's a lot of private money going into that. But I think the biggest improvements will come from public education. That's what's happened over the last 100 years. I think it will happen over the next 50. Great. Well, it's been a fantastic conversation. I don't think you should underestimate uh, in this kind of cultural challenge the role of humour. Uh, I always enjoy the story about two people living in a residential home and the woman says to the man, I, I bet you I can tell you how old you are. And he says, well, go on then. And she says, well, first of all, I need to see you naked. Uh, so they go upstairs and she carries out a very intimate examination of him. And she says, you're 87. And he says, that's absolutely remarkable. He said, how did you do that? And she said, um, you told me last Tuesday. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, on that highly inappropriate note, uh, thank you um, for your uh, questions. Thank you for joining us. One of the things you can do uh, in the many, many, many years ahead of you is read great books. Uh, and here is one. Uh, so uh, if you uh, want to, you can get a copy of the book outside. It's a fantastic book, very readable and full of fascinating stuff. And you, you don't get one signature, you get two signatures uh, uh, if, if you do that. So please, please do that. But uh, just finally join me in thanking Linda and Andrew.